Uh, okay, during the break, I was asked a few questions. I guess I missed some uh, to mention some details, or I, I, I should uh, uh, elaborate on some points. Uh, the first one here is uh, uh, that uh, when I was talking about microfuel distribution, probably I forgot to mention that this distribution is for ideal plasma, and when you do take into account interaction between plasma particles, of course the distribution will be different. For the, the, stronger is the, the stronger plasma coupling is, the further this uh, curve will uh, deviate from the ideal plasma case, but it's not principal difference. I mean, it will look more or less like the same. They will be peak at some value, and they will be uh, tail, sometimes it's exponential tail, when it's actually easy to understand if your radiator is charged, that uh, other perturbers cannot uh, approach it very close. There is a, say, classical minimal approach distance, right? And after that, the, 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 the far tail will be determined only by, by, by a Maxwellian tail, so it will be exponential decay here. Uh, the other point uh, I probably should mention that the natural broadening exercise line shape, it's nice to show how you get Lorentzian, but usually in practice, natural broadening can be safely uh, ignored, except for, uh, for X-ray emission when the Einstein coefficients become large, and so the natural broadening could become important. And in general, natural broadening if includes also uh, not only just spontaneous radiative decay, but also uh, phenomena like Auger decay, in which case it could be even stronger for, for mid-Z elements, okay? S say the shape of K-alpha lines, I don't want to, uh, to, to elaborate much, but it's mainly determined by this this uh, natural phenomena, Auger and uh, spontaneous radiative decay. Uh, and the last point, uh, when uh, <coughs> here I was talking about this ergodicity arguments, of course, that assumes the, the particles in my ensemble are independent radiators, which Coming back to the anal uh, analogy with uh, throwing dice, if you look at your uh, neighbor and try to afterwards <laughs> cheat with the dice, the, the result will be different. So yes, we are talking about uh, independent radiators. That means no coherent plasma radiation here. Okay, that's the assumption. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so uh, it's nice that we talked right now about uh, about natural broadening because basically what it says the the width of uh, the width of a line width is determined by the time of life of its level, or when both levels are unstable, it's of course sum of uh, two uh, uh, two contributions. Uh, there is uh, probably a bit uh, of uh, long <laughs> expression, <laughs> but I will explain you. That's an uh, expression for the line broadening of uh, isolated lines. In a minute, I will explain what I mean by, what people mean by isolated lines. Uh, so what it says, the width of a line can be calculated according, according to the following rules. There are uh, two uh, main contributions. One comes through inelastic processes. And uh, uh, here you, uh, if you look at one of these terms, basically what you see is integral F, sorry for, for confusion, here F is not the field, F is a distribution of velocities, it's a Maxwellian distribution usually. Uh, so it's just sigma and V that you know that the rate of, uh, of collisional process. Of course, when you integrate over the uh, 
velocity distribution, you get uh, temperature r rate for a given temperature. So it's a rate of all inelastic processes, of all processes that cause electron to go from level U, upper level, to, to some another level. And the same, of course, for the low level of the transition. We account for all transition, for all collisions that cause electron to go, to, to, to jump from L to, to some another L prime level. So actually this part is, is should be for, for people working with collisions, straightforward evidence. There is something more which is uh, less uh, evident, and here is the <coughs> difference uh, of, uh, of uh, elastic scattering amplitudes of the upper and lower level. So it can be uh, the total broadening, the total width can be uh, written as a sum of this inelastic part and elastic part. Okay, so it's here they are written explicitly. Um, Like I said, it's just very similar to the. Uh, it's very similar to, to what we saw for for um, for for spontaneous uh, for, for natural line broadening. <coughs> and uh, yeah, the meaning of isolated lines is that the 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 broadening of a given level uh, is small compared to distance in energy to other levels with strictly speaking to only we you need to consider only those levels that cause that stark broadening that broadening okay so once we have lines that basically do not overlap one with another in the spectrum one can assume the isolated lines case so it's just sum of inverse values of time of life of upper and lower levels, the inelastic part, okay? Uh, in principle, one can generalize it to other, uh, impact, uh, opera uh, other impact processes like ionization, recombination, etc. Uh, so the width is just the inelastic part is sum of uh, the population rates of upper and the population rates of the lower levels. Uh, again, that was uh, derived assuming uh, isolated lines. When the lines are not isolated, you can no longer use this uh, simple uh, expression for calculating uh, uh, stark line broadening. Uh, a few words about what's called uh, standard theory of line broadening that was developed by uh, a um, few famous scientists around 60s, including Hans Grimm, and in Russia there was Sobelman, and uh, a few more, uh, of course, I don't want to, to, to limit it to just these two, of course, contributed to development of this theory. And as I said, it's 60s, uh, no computers, no, no computers comparable to the powerful ones we have today. So people had to, to, to invent uh, ways of doing with the, the problem of n-body, basically n-body problem analytically. So the standard theory basically says we will talk separately about, consider separately ions and electrons. So ions are static, quasi-static. So for quasi-static, it's very simple. Like I showed you an example with Lyman alpha. Just take for each given value of electric field, of micro field, calculate the spectrum, then do convolution with the uh, field distribution, and you get the line shape. Fine. Electrons are different, and electrons are so fast, you saw in the simulation, electrons are usually much faster than uh, ions, and they're so fast, that, uh, they can be treated like uh, collisions, the impact approximation, which, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I forgot to mention, in the previous slide, uh, 
when I said it's very much similar to, to the derivation we did for, for spontaneous emission, in which case we got Lorentzian. So the result of this impact mechanism, like uh, impact excitation, ionization, etc., give rise also the Lorentzian shape. Okay? And that's basically what you see here. It's uh, if you take a uh, uh, real part of this uh, complex uh, denominator, actually it's operator, you will get Lorentz and shape, modified uh, a, a general uh, Lorentz and shape in which, okay, uh, let's not go into the details. Okay, but the basic idea of uh, standard theory of line broadening is strict separation of slow particles, which are usually ions, and fast particles, which are usually electrons. In principle, it could be the case when ions are also so fast that they can be safely considered in the same impact approximation. Fine, but uh, the, the, the real problem is with intermediate cases. When uh, ions do move and the motion is important, but they are not really in the impact regime, and there is no easy, there was no easy analytical way found by that time to deal with that. Uh, the, the problem of inability to, 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 to work with iron motion was that the main driving reason behind the uh, invention of, uh, of, of using of computer simulations for line shape broadening problem. Uh, the pioneer is uh, Roland Stamm, uh, who was by that time, I guess, postdoc of uh, Voslamber, Dietrich Voslamber. And uh, the idea is actually very simple. You just simulate plasma, right? Uh, just put N body, uh, solve N body <laughs> problem, put sufficiently large number of particles in a sufficiently large box, let them move and interact. You can calculate the line, uh, you can calculate electric fields as a function of time. Just give it as an input for the Schrodinger equation, time-dependent Schrodinger equation, you solve it. You get anything from Schrodinger equation, including the evolution of the dipole operator, calculate autocorrelation function, take Fourier, and that's all. So very simple, except that it's quite time-consuming. And it is still time-consuming today, and you can imagine it was a, a, a real, a real enterprise to do it in the uh, end of 70s, but these guys did it, and the results were very impressive, really. Uh, so I'm just going to show you exactly the same, just in the graphical way. So computer simulations, they are still basically the same today. Of course, computers are different, and you take more particles, the, the, everything is more accurate, et cetera, et cetera. But the main, the, the, the main structure of the computer simulation of line shape broadening is basically the same. So you have something which I call particle field generator, which just end body, end body simulations of various complexity. And in principle, it may con include also external magnetic or electric fields. These fields also can be time dependent. What you get as a result, as an output of this uh, part of the simulation code is something like that. Field history is just, I plotted just absolute value, let's say, but of course it's, it's vector. You have all projection. So you have three dimensional field. And then you solve, yeah, you solve Schrodinger equation, time dependent Schrodinger equation. And the result, you get uh, evolution of time uh, evolution operator, and you get evolution of dipole operator, taken Fourier transform. That's actually the, the simplest uh, part here. You get the, the spectrum. Uh, uh, how do you solve it usually? You one mm, nobody solves Schrodinger equation, of course, in the coordinate uh, space. It's always matrix. Uh, so that's the Schrodinger equation. We can rewrite it in form of the time development operator. That's in the, in the interaction representation. Uh, the dipole operator is calculated like that. When you have the evolution operator uh, handy, 
And then uh, one either do the indeed autocorrelation function, like I've shown you, or say I in my uh, simulation is doing just directly taking Fourier of, of dipole and uh, taking square of absolute value. And there is also some fine details about light polarization and dependence on the on the well-known dependence on the energy of the transition, but basically that's the same. So the, the idea, as I say, is very simple. The, there could not be a simpler model for line shape calculation, except that it is uh, very time consuming. Uh, so obviously, people are trying to, to, to invent, to find ways of dealing with this problem using a simpler means. I, I don't have time to, to describe everything. I will be a bit biased here and uh, show you some uh, my results and my colleagues. Uh, if you look at the, uh, yeah, obviously when you solve Schrodinger equation, the, the, the larger number of, of states you have in it, the, the, the more problematic is, it, the, the more difficult is to solve. Difficult in terms of uh, computer time, of course. Uh, so the, the higher number of components in a given transition is, the, the harder is to solve it. Uh, and uh, hydrogen or hydrogen-like transition between high-end lines, Rydberg transition, are especially problematic here because the number of components goes, like you know, as n squared, and you can easily get to a completely unman unmanageable uh, problem even with today's computers. Uh, just to put you into the, some context, I once calculated using computer simulations Balmer. Uh, 15 line from n equal 15 to n equal 2. And for a single line shape, for a single density, single temperature, it took about two months of, uh, of CPU time, OK? Uh, OK, on the other hand, high end lines are important for diagnostics. I, I don't want to, to go into the details. So, uh, but interesting point is if you look at a uh, spectrum, and now it's static stark effect of some high n, in this case Lyman 9, which means n equal 9 to n equal 1 transition, you look separately at pi and sigma components, you can pay attention that each one, that the components, the intensities of each pi and sigma component separately form uh, or lie on a parabola. And if you do sum of pi and sigma, and usually that's the case in plasma, that the microfields has no specific direction, so you can safely average. So obviously, average of these two uh, mirrored parabola is just a rectangular shape. So that was the idea. Let's use rectangular line shape instead of very complex uh, stark uh, pattern. Well, so that's it. Uh, you defined a line shape static, static line shape. As a, as a rectangular, it's zero beyond that values and the constant value inside, of course, it should be normalized to have, we always want it to normalize to one, of course, area normalized, so that's a numerical coefficient, which depends on the stark uh, constant of this, of given transition. And in the case of hydrogen, it can, there is a well-known expression in all textbooks about uh, atomic, uh, about quantum uh, atomic physics. Uh, there is simple de uh, generalization for not just Lyman, but in principle any transition from n to n prime, then just uh, straightforward one. So uh, again, we have rectangular line shape for a fixed value of electric field. So next step, if we want to, to do it uh, in the quasi-static approximation, let's do a convolution with a field distribution. And in the case of, um, in the case of, uh, uh, yes, so the, the field distribution is given by that, and I do by uh, W of F, and I do that simple convolution. And uh, you remember this normalization that f is used uh, in the, uh, that was uh, obtained in deriving the Hoysmark field distribution. So F0 again, and that's the Hoysmark constant. And we can c go to uh, dimensionless units. Uh, 
both for the field, it's the same beta we saw when I plotted the, the Hotzman distribution, and instead of using these energies we, or frequencies, we normalized it to, uh, let's say, typical stark splitting for the, for the same given field, for, 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 for Hotzmark field, and then everything can be expressed in uh, a very nice way, and uh, uh, which becomes, so there is a one single numerical integration here, and in fact, if we talk about, uh, about uh, ideal plasma, which is always good to, to begin with, this can be done analytically, and that's, uh, the result is a very simple expression, and it's a universal expression that should explain, in principle, any line shape in the quasi-static approximation for sufficiently high n. What is sufficiently high is a separate question, of course. But in practice, quite surprisingly for me, even though I began all this work for a really high n transition, often even, you know, n, uh, actually what's important is not n, but delta n, difference between upper and lower n. So even for delta n as low as 2, the results are very nice. Uh, okay, so let's see how this uh, function looks like. So I plot that with a green dashed line, and I, as is uh, a custom in uh, line shape uh, uh, literature, if the line shape is symmetric, let's just plot only one half of it, the rest will be symmetric. So that's this universal function, that, and I plot the same uh, true calculations of two lines, two high lines, Lyman 9 and Lyman 10. Uh, and you see that except of the central region, the rest is just an extremely nice, extremely nice fit. It's not fit, yeah, it's in an analytical derivation. Uh, but in fact, if you do include some other uh, broadening mechanisms, which always exist, like Doppler or electron impact broadening or whatever, they will smooth the central part as well. So the result will often be practically indistinguishable. That's why it also, as I said, quite surprisingly work even for relatively low principal quantum numbers. Okay, so that's quasi-static. And, but you do want to take into, into account dynamics. That's basically the point when I said, when people started to use computer simulations to, to, to find a way to somehow deal with ion motion. I, but there was a few other approaches to, to, to deal with ion motion, and one of them that I want to, 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 to briefly describe is uh, what's called frequency fluctuation model. Uh, initially, it was uh, uh, developed by, uh, in uh, something like 20 or even more years ago, but it was recently reformulated. Basically, it's the same, but, but the mathematical formulation is, uh, is a cleaner one. Uh, so what it says, the field, the microfield, fluctuates. Fluctuates with different frequency, but we can uh, find uh, some typical one. Well, there is quite obvious choice for the typical frequency. You just take typical velocity, divide over typical distance, interparticle distance, and there must be a frequency. Okay, so what is the typical velocity? Is of course the Maxwellian one and typical distance and just uh, density to the power of minus uh, three. Yeah, it's in denominator, so here it's plus one third. Uh, and uh, well, forgetting about uh, numerical factors. And once you know, once you assume the field fluctuates with some frequency, you say, okay, so it fluctuates, and when you have, once you have electrons sitting at one component, stark component of a, at a fixed, a fixed uh, electric field, there are many components, like you saw in Lyman 9, for example, that's a whole forest of, of, uh, of components. So it sits, the field is static, but then field fluctuates and electron jumps to another uh, component, and it does it randomly. That the assumption of this FFM method, the jumping is random from any state, from any uh, stark component, you ra jump randomly to another one. And in mathematical terms, it can be expressed via uh, this. Actually, it's w w very simple expressions. So 
the line shape is calculated like that, that expression, okay, where the only uh, computationally intensive, but it's nothing compared to computational intens <laughs> intensive uh, simulation, of course, it's just, again, it's just simple integral, numerical integration. You start from quasi-static line shape, which is, in the case of uh, high N, I showed you, can be done really simple. Then do this integration, and you can imagine that describes something which, uh, which it's kind of diffusion, and that's exactly the, the, the notion here for frequency fluctuation. You diffuse the static line shape with a typical frequency, which is defined by here. And then there is a, some another operation. I don't want to, to explain the details, but if you look in this paper, it, it has a very nice explanation of how you derive it. Just uh, I, I don't have time now, but it's quite straightforward. So let's try to apply this method to this. I, I forgot to say that this substitution of uh, of complex line shape with just simple rectangular. I call it quasi contiguous because you can forget about distances between there are so many uh, components and forget about each discrete component, describe it as a one, a contiguous entity, the rectangular one, okay? So if you plug in, the, the expression becomes very simple for that J, this J integration can be done analytically and you get this universal Universal expression is because it's universal when once you do the scaling of all parameters to the to the typical uh, frequency and the typical stark uh, uh, static stark effect of for a given transition. But when you do the scaling, all transition, any transition is described by exactly the same expression. Uh, I want to show you uh, some application of this method. Uh, you, you've heard already a few times in the previous days about continuum lowering. And actually, continuum lowering is uh, a bit of confusing topics. Uh, there are different uh, ways of, of thinking about continuum lowering. One is, uh, what is continuum, for example? Uh, one can say it's uh, once you stop to see a bound spectrum. Another approach say, no. Continuum is when the electrons are free, which is not the same. It's the same when you are considering a single atom, but in plasma it's different. The electron could be not free. You must apply some work to get it out of plasma, yet the, the spectrum that it produces is, is no longer uh, discrete. Okay? So that's uh, confusion and uh, some approaches to continuum lowering that is good when you really understand you want to, 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 to define with it what is the limit of free electrons, it's not necessarily the same when you see the, 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 the transition from, from discrete spectrum to continuum one. Uh, I want to describe you some approach that was uh, uh, given in a, a book of uh, Hans Grimm. Uh, by the way, he, he cites in this uh, context, a paper where, which he co-authored, but in that paper I didn't find this explanation. So, so I, I, I quoted that the, the, the textbook because I didn't find it uh, ex uh, explicitly explained in any other paper. In any paper, okay. So what to do? Let's calculate a bound bound spectra for a series. We want to calcul calculate it for a series and continue up to the some principal quantum number at which the broadening of that line will be comparable to the distance between the neighbor levels. And that's the reason be behind the Inglis-Teller uh, effect, Inglis-Teller criterion that you've heard already a few times before, okay? And we may continue actually if for a few more principal quantum numbers just to make sure we have a smooth transition. And uh, uh, we will assume free bound edge at the, 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 the position of the last member of the series we, at which we stop. We, con we do the convolution of the free bound continuum, which is, uh, in is uh, you know, is drawn as a sharp edge. We do convolution with the same line broadening we got for the last members of the, of the bound bound series. 
and sum up. I, I want to point to stress that there is no ionization potential depression is assumed here. I just want to calculate the, 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 the line broadening of a series. And that's the result for uh, Lyman series, hydrogen Lyman series in uh, modestly dense plasma, 10 to the 17 particles per cubic centimeter, one EV temperature. And I do not put here Boltzmann, uh, trivial Boltzmann factor for comparison. And that is the series. Uh, one calculation is done with this QC FFM, very fast method that took about one second. The other calculation is computer simulation. Is I actually believe it one of the most uh, massive uh, computer simulation of line shape ever done. Uh, that's almost 400 fully interacting states, and it took about one month on today's computer. So the speed factor, if you use this simple uh, analytical uh, expression, is about three millions. And you see how nicely they compare. Actually, there is a small difference here, but there is no continuum uh, wave function in computer simulation that, was, that would uh, increase the size of uh, my Hamiltonian to infinity, which is not doable. So, but as long as we are talking about bound-bound uh, series, the, the, the agreement is extremely nice. Uh, so now we want to compare with real measurements. And that's actually the only time I show you something in wavelengths because that's uh, how experimentalists present the result. Uh, OK, so that uh, uh, high N series in, uh, again, hydrogen, it's Balmer uh, series, OK? Uh, very nice experiments. I do not think there are uh, comparable experimental studies of, of of, of, of the same accuracy. So it's extremely nice data, really. And it's not easy in general to reproduce. And now I'm trying to reproduce it using the inferred value that were given from, I believe, Thompson scattering. Uh, so we have densities. And I'm doing the, this. It's not computer simulation. It's just this simple analytical. Uh, calculation which takes one second, actually it can be made to milliseconds if I wish, with some uh, computer tricks, uh, programming tricks, and just see how similar they are. Uh, really, even up to uh, very, very fine details, like here for the lowest density, 1.8, 10 to the uh, 16, yes, you have epsilon. And then you have, what it goes, uh, zeta. I don't remember, right? Zeta. And then something a bit here. And you do, hear, do see something a bit here. So actually, the agreement is extremely nice. And again, the, the approach is very simple. And it's so simple that, uh, I, well, I wrote a program. Uh, I, I intended to make it public by the time of, of this uh, school, I didn't have time, but I, I'll try to do it in the coming months, so it, it will be distributed uh, freely, of course, at a, as a simple program, and it runs extremely fast, and you can calculate and hydrogen, at least hydrogen-like. Of course, it's not for, for isolated lines. For isolated lines, there are uh, different methods, but for hydrogen-like, especially for high end, which is very difficult to calculate uh, just analytically, I, I promise we will have this tool <laughs> soon. I just need to find time to, to, to do it, to publish a paper. And so there will be attachment, <laughs> extra material. OK. Uh, I want to, to mention a data source when you can find a, a pre-computed or, or you can compute uh, line shapes. So one is. Uh, uh, Stark B database, which is for isolated lines. There are quite a few uh, species and transitions. Uh, it's no, it's nowhere complete, but but it's a large database. So probably you should start if if you need to find the Stark Bronin for isolated line, you should go to this uh, point. <coughs> and by the way, like I said, 
there's always a question uh, how strong field is when you go from quadratic uh, limit to the linear, and the same is true for isolated lines. For low density, it would be isolated line for, for any line, but there is for, for sufficiently high density, the line will no longer be isolated. So this uh, database uh, also, the results also, they, 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 they quote the maximum value of density for which you can safely use the data, okay? You can safely assume that the line is uh, isolated. Uh, another source is the classic book of uh, Hans Grimm. There are appendices which list broadening and, and shifts and widths of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a neutral, of, of very many neutral and single ionized ions. Uh, there is also uh, appendices in the same book about hydrogen but I do not recommend you to use those, okay? But for isolated lines, it's, it, it, it's good. I, 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 from time to time, I do the calculations of different lines and compare with Hans' calculations. I, I always surprised how accurate they are. I mean, I, I use today computer simulations, and the, it's not computer simulation. It's uh, just this standard theory of line broadening, and there are many problematic, in principle, problematic issues with that. But most of the time, the results are very accurate. So it's not electronic form, but we need two pages through the book. Uh, the other one, that's uh, a plasma formula, that's a self-advertisement. Uh, you can calculate a, a lot of different things with it, uh, including the stark broadening of hydrogen-like or Rydberg uh, transition. So for isolated lines, you go to this. This two for hydrogen-like, you go to this one. And uh, it's always good to compare. You plot both of them as a function of density, and they at which some point they will intersect, and just do interpolation between the two. Maybe I'll show examples. Okay, the, the last but not the least, there is NIST Atomic Spectral Line Broadening Bibliographic Database, which has a lot of uh, links, li a lot of uh, entries on stark broadening literature. Okay. Uh, a few notes on line shape accuracy. Uh, well, line shape calculation is very uh, complex task. And... Uh, as always uh, with the complex calculations to, to, to really give a correct value of theoretical uncertainty is uh, sometimes even more difficult than do the calculations themselves. So uh, one should uh, really be critical about using just average, let's say, source of on uh, published data on line broadening. Uh, I have a few rules of thumb that I use myself, and you can consider them as useful. Uh, something like that, if there is a study on line broadening and there is no mention of accuracy at all, factor two, factor three, don't expect it to be more accurate than factor two, okay? If people do claim some accuracy, about 20, 40 percent, give or, ta or take, uh, it must be discussed and explained in the paper. If it's not, go back to this assumption, okay? Uh, 10 to 20 percent, there is really must be a separate section devoted to accuracy. Again, if it doesn't exist, go to here, number one, factor two. Three to 10, that must be a subject of the study. The study must be that we want to compare that with that, and accuracy is our point. If not, go to number one. Well, sometimes you do see studies which claim less than, better than 3% accuracy, in particular comparison to experimental data, but even without comparison to experimental data. I do not list do not give you a suggestion, advice for politically correct reasons, but basically throw that to the trash bin. Uh, 
that paper, okay? Uh, uh, one caveat, uh, pay attention, some data, so some uh, database, yes, some published data, it, when people say with, it might mean full with at half max, sometimes it means half with at half max. So if you do not pay attention, you get that factor two. In addition to factor two that, <laughs> okay, and that, well, sometimes it helps. But who knows? So please, uh, in particular, in the book of Hans Grimm, width is half width at half max, okay? But for example, in star B database, is full width at half max. Please pay attention. Uh, well, there, I know of at least one study, published study by a I don't say famous person, it's ill-famous person, not to give names, who claim that uh, calculations of Hans Grimm were wrong by a large factor about two, <laughs> which turned out to be he forgot, or I don't know what, that in those tables in Hans Grimm's book, half weeks, half marks are given, okay? So don't make a similar mistake. Well, uh, I have a few more minutes, and well, first of all, I, I want to, to give you a list of, uh, a short list of recommended uh, books and reviews. Number one, of course, is the classical textbook of Hans Grimm on spectral line broadening. And then uh, a very nice in, uh, introduction to plasma spectroscopy, really, it's given in very simple terms, and there is a nice chapter on line broadening by uh, Ahim Kunze, who was the first lecturer in this school. And there is a nice, uh, uh, nice review of, uh, of models for stark broadening by Marco Gigozos. It's a recent review. And there is a, at least also, self-promoting a bit, uh, and that's a short mini review on computer simulation models in line shapes. So uh, maybe I'll show you in the remaining uh, five or so minutes. Uh, well, that's the interface uh, for Stark B uh, database. Uh, do you see, do I need to increase fonts so it's okay? Yes or not? Increase. Increase, okay. Uh, well, if I increase too much, uh, there would be a problem with, uh, you know, working with that. Let's first keep here and when we go to the data, I'll increase. Okay, so you go to access to the data. Uh, by the way, this is part of the, of the virtual uh, observatory project, uh, European project. Uh, so, for example, pick, uh, uh, I know, helium, okay, in this case there is no, uh, there is no ionized helium because ionized helium would be hydrogenic and hydrogenic is not, uh, lines are not isolated, that's why you do not see it here, okay, so you go to uh, select, uh, so in this case just one. Uh, Pick your density. Uh, you can also enter just specific value, but for the case of isolated lines, like you remember, it's just sigma nv, so the broadening is proportional to the density, so there is no need actually to, to, to pick anything than one of the standard ones. Uh, so uh, transition. Uh, as you see, there are quite a few. Mm, uh, what do we want? I don't know. Pick your choice, whatever. Uh, you can also select a wavelength interval and the temperature, or you can select all, okay? Uh, by the way, the calculations are done and uh, the, by uh, uh, Sylvie, now I can increase phone, yeah. It's based on the code by Sylvie Sahalbrecho. <laughs> 
and uh, Milan Dmitrievich and uh, collaborator. Uh, I believe that for, for, for the interface itself. Uh, there are references that you can follow. And here's the result, the density, the transition, the wavelengths of the transition, and the uh, broadening coefficient. Uh, not broadening coefficient, there is a, a width, sorry, width and uh, shift of the transition. As you see, it's a function of, uh, of function of uh, temperature. Where do you see temperature? It must be. Yeah, yeah, here's the temperature. And for several values of temperature, we have width, full width half max in this case, and shift of the transition. And if you need something in between, you can interpolate. Uh, usually the grid is chosen sufficiently dense and uh, sufficiently wide, wide to cover uh, any important temperature for a specific transition. Okay. And by the way, they provide also fitting coefficients uh, to, to fit the data if you do not want to, to interpolate just by simple interpolation. Also, there is a simple expression for interpolation. Okay. Uh, the other one I mentioned is the plasma formulary. And the, the link, uh, actually we will have a session afternoon devoted to resources for line, uh, for, for atomic uh, data, uh, something like that. And maybe I will have more time to, to explain. Here now I just to, to show one simple example of calculations. So it's a web uh, based utility, you don't need to install anything. It, you select plasma parameters, let's say 10 to the 16, temperature, uh, ion parameters, charge, mass, and temperature, which is by default the same. Uh, you select atomic, uh, you select uh, the same for radiator. It's charge, mass, and temperature. Uh, it's maybe a percentage if it's used as a dopant. Uh, finally, you pick your, select the atomic system actually. In this case, charge is one means the core is, charge is zero means it's hydrogen. And let's uh, look for, for example, H beta. Uh, so it transitions from n equal 4 to 2. Right. We go to Explorer, and here we are interested in the energy, total stark width, which is given in electron volts. You may to calculate it in inverse centimeters. There is no Anstroms. If you insist, you need to do this stupid 1 over lambda, etc. calculations yourself. <laughs> okay, and you can, uh, well, I will have more minutes to, 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 to show you more uh, capabilities of this tool afternoon, okay? Well, I think that's all. The time is uh, over. Coffee break. <laughs>